This is Professor George Easton, and this is part two of my discussion of the bias variance trade off, basic cross validation, and overfitting in the context of prediction. In this video, we're going to look at actual examples which will show how overfitting occurs and how cross validation can be used to prevent it. The demonstration I'm going to show you in this video is going to be done using R and RStudio. Now the purpose of this video is not to really delve into the R code, but I have provided the source code for the R file that I'm going to use in this video at the link shown on this slide. What you're looking at now is my notebook computer screen running RStudio. And the code file is shown in this window here on the upper left hand side. Now I'm going to demonstrate the idea of overfitting and cross validation by using a regression tree. And I'm sort of expecting that you have some idea of what regression trees are. If you don't, I will explain it at least a little bit as I'm going along so that you'll definitely get the gist of what is happening. I'm also going to do this demonstration using a data set on automobiles and in particular we're going to look at the miles per gallon or fuel efficiency versus the weight of the automobile. But to do these two things I need to install two libraries. One is called tree to do the regression trees and the other one is called ISLR which contains the auto data set. So I'm beginning this code file with the library statements for tree and ISLR. You will have had to install these packages using this package tab and install over here if you haven't already done so. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you what the data looks like. So this is the data for 392 automobiles showing on the y-axis the miles per gallon and on the x-axis the weight of the vehicle in pounds. So as you might expect, what you see is that the overall trend of the gas mileage goes down as the weight of the vehicle increases. Now I don't have a lot of data here, only about 400 observations. And in most data science problems, I would hope to have thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of data points. But nevertheless, I'll be able to use this data set to illustrate the key points that I'd like to. But you should understand that the results shown here will have more random noise in them than would occur in a much larger data set. Now the first thing I'm going to do is to split the data set into a training data set and a validation data set and I'm going to use about a two-thirds split for the training data set and the remaining one-third for the validation data set. So the next block of code creates the training data set which I've called auto train and the validation data set which I've called auto val. Now since I've reduced the sample size by a third I'm going to replot the data so we can take a look at what the training data actually looks like. And you can see that the general pattern is exactly the same as when I plotted the entire data set. But this is going to be the data that we are going to use to fit the regression trees. Now a regression tree with one node is exactly the same as taking the mean of the data that is the mean of the y values. So if I have one node I can't split the data at all and what I'm going to do is to choose the value to represent the data that minimizes the sum of squared errors between that value and the various data points. And the mean minimizes that sum of squares error. So what I've shown you in this picture is essentially what a regression tree looks like when there is only one node. Now I'm going to fit a regression tree and make a plot for two nodes. So here's what the regression tree fit looks like for two nodes. What has happened is that the regression tree procedure has searched 
through all of the values on the x-axis, on the weight, for a split that will give the best possible fit to the data overall if a constant value is fit on each of the two pieces. So the data has been split into two pieces at the value of weight at about 2,800 pounds. On each of the two parts, the mean value of the y's is computed because it is the constant value which minimizes the mean square error on that part. Now I'm going to change the number of nodes to three. And what the regression tree procedure will do is it will look at the two separate data sets that we have so far and will look for the best split inside of each one and then it will pick the one that improves the mean square error for the data set the most overall. So let me go ahead and run the block of code. So here is what the fit looks like for three nodes and you can see that the tree procedure decided it was best to split the portion of the data that lay below the original split here. And what it found is that a split at about 2,200 pounds provides the most improvement to the overall mean square error. So I think you now understand how this works. I'm going to go ahead and rerun it for four nodes, which corresponds to four splits in the data set and it could split in any one of these locations, in any one of these pieces. But what it's going to do is pick the piece to split where the improvement in the mean square error is the best overall. So here is the fit for four nodes. And so it decided to split the original portion of the data set that lay above the 2800 pounds. And we can just go ahead and continue this process and watch how the fit is improved at each of the steps. So here is what the fit looks like for six nodes. And now we get a different kind of behavior. In this case, the best split was to fit really this single observation. So what we're beginning to see now is that the regression tree is not just fitting the overall structure in the data, it's begun to essentially fit the random variation or the noise. So let's go ahead and look at what happens when there are seven nodes. And again we get another split and fit here that is essentially fitting random noise. So in the next block of code I have a for loop which will fit the regression tree for five up to 130 nodes in steps of five. So it'll go five, 10, 15, and so on. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens to the fit. So there is the fit that we've already seen for five nodes. And here will be the fit for 10 and 15. And I'm just gonna go ahead and step all the way up to 130 nodes. And as we add more and more nodes, you can see that the fit is fitting more and more of the random variation. Because the model is so flexible, the bias will be very low. In other words, it will be able to, on average, fit the structure in the data. But because it's too flexible, it's now fitting the random variation as well. So this very clearly shows you the idea of overfitting of the data. So now I'm going to repeat what I just did, which is to show you the fit of the tree to the training data set as the number of nodes is increased. But now I'm going to show you at the same time what's going on with the validation data set. And in addition, in each of these figures, I'm going to show you what the mean square error is for that data set. So I've begun here with two nodes, and you can see that the mean square error on the training data set is 26.7, and the mean square error on the validation data set is 28.52. So now we're going to go ahead and fit three nodes. And you can see that the training mean square error has now 
dropped to 21.46, and the validation mean square error has dropped as well to 23.48. So now we'll see what happens with four nodes. And you can see that the training mean square error has continued to drop, as has the validation mean square error. With five nodes, the training mean square error continues to drop, and the validation mean square error has changed very little in this case. And now I'm just going to go ahead and step through the number of nodes, and you can see what's happening. So notice that the mean square error on the training data set continues to go down, but the mean square error on the validation data set is going up. And what we're having happen on the validation data set is that the prediction is responding to the random variation in the training data set, which is totally, in a sense, wrong for this validation data set. So let me continue increasing the number of nodes. So by the time we're up to 130 nodes, the mean square error on the training data set is at 2.25, but the mean square error on the validation data set is 26.48. So what we've seen here is the bias variance trade-off in action that we discussed in part one of this video. The mean square error continues to improve on the training data set as the model becomes more flexible. But the mean square error on the validation data set improves for a while as the flexibility in the model is allowing the main structural features to be fit, but then it starts to decrease as the training data set is overfit and that fit reflects random variation that's occurring in the training data set that does not occur in the validation data set. So as I stepped through all of these trees that correspond to varying the number of nodes in the fit, I have captured the mean square error on both the training data set and on the validation data set. And this allows us to make a plot that shows the bias variance trade-off similar to the one that was discussed in part one. So here is the plot. On the x-axis, we have the number of nodes, which represents the flexibility or the complexity of the model. And on the y-axis, we have the mean square error. The blue trace here shows what happens to the mean square error on the training data set. And as you can see, it starts up here around 26 or so, and it just continues to decrease through the entire span of the number of nodes that we're considering. The mean square error on the validation data set, however, starts here a little bit worse than the training data set, and it improves as the model complexity increases and allows the basic structure of the data to be fit. But after a certain point, in particular in this case when there are six nodes, the performance begins to decrease as overfitting occurs in the training sample and random noise is being fit by the regression tree procedure. And so you can see that for the red trace corresponding to the validation data set, the performance gets worse and worse as the number of nodes increases beyond the six, which corresponds to the minimum and the best model according to this cross-validation procedure. So this concludes my discussion of the basics of the bias-variance trade-off, of the idea of overfitting, and of the most basic kind of cross-validation, which is based on having a holdout validation data set. Cross-validation is an extremely important idea in data science, because it does in fact prevent overfitting which occurs when a too flexible model is fit to the training data. Now I've demonstrated the bias variance trade-off and the problem of overfitting using regression trees. 
but I want to make sure that you understand that this phenomenon is not limited to regression trees. It occurs any time that you have models whose complexity can increase and therefore flexibility can increase in such a way that random structure in the data can be fit by those models. So don't think that this is in any way limited to regression trees. In addition, I'd like to comment that the data set that I've been using here is not very large, about 400 observations. So if you had thousands or tens of thousands of observations, you'd get exactly the same kind of phenomenon going on, but there would be a lot less variation in the plots that you make, such as the one that we are looking at here, showing the mean square error trace for both the training data set and the validation data set.